Welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads, a podcast all about beer from a West Virginia perspective. I'm Aaron McCoy here with my podcast partner, Charles Bakway. Well, thank you, Aaron. Here it is only the first week of June and we're already digging summer in Charleston, West Virginia. The week leading up to Memorial Day weekend, we had huge crowds out downtown Charleston for the bicycle races. Then this past weekend was chock full of events and activities for Pride Week. Holy moly, it's been busy. Aaron, what's been your impression of how we're starting summer this year? Wow, it's definitely been an incredible start. The crowds have already turned out and even turned it up a few notches from previous summers and downtown Charleston has definitely been buzzing. What do you say we introduce today's guest so we can get his read on the summer's beginning and find out how it's impacting beer sales at our downtown breweries. Okay, let's do it. The man of the hour is Ross Williams, head brewer at Bad Shepherd Beer Company. Ross, welcome back to West Virginia Beer Roads. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to see you guys. Great to be here. It's a busy, busy start to summer, huh? I think so. Been selling some beer, it seems like. Yeah, well, we just love being here talking to Ross, Aaron, and I. I mean, we spend a little time here ourselves uh, just on social hours. Don't you just love it when you really don't have anything other to do than make a bunch of beers and the city of Charleston is doing all their promotions, bringing the crowds into you? Isn't that, uh, doesn't that make your life easy? Oh, absolutely. It's um, great to move some product. Um, it, it does sometimes present a challenge in keeping the variety up, mm-hmm. but that's okay. <laughs> You're happy for that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, do you have a feel for beer sales momentum? I mean, this year versus last year, or year before, I mean, are beer sales up or Did most of the increased business from all these promotions we've been seeing in downtown, did that go just to food sales? Oh, I, you know, I would say this, I'd say the two go hand in hand for, for our establishment. I mean, um, you know, I, I don't really know about specifics, specific numbers, but it certainly seems like, um, coming in here Monday, there were a lot of empty kegs from the bar, you know? (laughs) And you don't have to deal with the food side. I know that's probably not your responsibility. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, constantly impressed by our our good staff back there in the restaurant side. But no, I mean, I'll help out with things around the building now and then. But no, um, kind of kind of glad I don't have to deal with that, too. Well, all of these people who came out for all of these special events, what have they been drinking? Let's talk about that. Talk about, you know, different beer styles, what, what's maybe been hot on Bad Shepherd's taps. Yeah, um, well, I, I would say Electric Petting Zoo, mm-hmm. you know, we all call it the EPZ. Um, our sales team was expecting to have some of that to sell this week, and it, they drank it all here <laughs> at the bar over the weekend. So they, that's, that's good. <laughs> Part of the variety you talked about earlier well yeah and that, but that's okay we have a new ipa right behind it so yeah so i mean some of the other beers that are moving here and this all these promotions what what went fast for you uh okay you know ipas are good sellers um but my bach uh drinking great right now and i think the public's appreciating that and we have our gosa west by gosa out and uh, you know a little citrusy a little salty um, nice summer beer, and, and it's selling well. Well, your neighbors up the block, I'm talking about uh, Fife Street Brewing and Short Story Brewing. Um, have you heard anything about how their business has fared during all those promotions of the last few weeks? I, you know, I know they're busy. Um, you can tell that just by walking by. Um, someone, at, someone at Fife Street told me that um, the first first day of pride and pride parade was their busiest day the last two years wow wow we'll, yeah we'll have to check with them uh, next time we talk to them on that because that's yeah that they've done some good they've had some good days in the past so if that was their best day yet that's got to be a great day for them i'll bet these past couple of weeks have provided the right kind of environment to give POTA a real shakedown cruise. So Ross, uh, what's your verdict? First, let's tell people what POTA is and uh, have your customers caught on to it. Sure, sure. 
So PODA stands for Private Outdoor Designated Area. And that, you know, that sounds a little confusing, but it's, it's called that because of the licensing that an establishment has to have. You have to have a private club license right. to participate in this, you know, outdoor promotion. So that's where the private comes from. But um, it, essentially it means a participating bar, restaurant, whatever, can sell you a, a drink to go in an approved uh, plastic cup. Yeah, the, the ones that even say PODA on them. Right. That's right. And, and after you get your PODA license. And it's, it's environmentally friendly plastic. It's, you know, my understanding is it's made out of corn. Yeah. So people get a beer at your place in the PODA cup or pour, a, pour one they bought into a PODA cup. You don't charge them extra for the PODA cup, do you? No, we do not. Okay, yeah. So then, then what happens after that? Where all can they take that beer if they don't drink it inside your bar? Well, the, the great news about the cup is it has a scannable QR code on it hmm. that will show you the map and everything. But basically, cool. um, you know, it's several, several square blocks. In the downtown area, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the boundaries. Well, I know it at least includes the street we're on, Quarrier Street. It includes next door, the Capitol Street, which has a number of uh, oh, yes. bars Summers. and restaurants. <laughs> and, uh, and it goes on down Capitol Street to the boulevard. Yeah. And um, does it go all the way to the, what do they call that, uh, the Haddad Riverfront stage or whatever? I mean, the whole... You know, I, I, the think, whole, uh, I think it actually stops there. It, it goes down to those participating bars okay. around the on corner. on Capitol Street and, and on, on the boulevard. boulevard. Yeah. That but makes I, sense. I think it does stop there because for different licensing reasons, it, it makes sense to leave the Riverfront Park out of yeah. it. Yeah. Well, anyway, and they, they, do, they get their festival license down there because that's where they're always doing festivals, and that's a different license from a POTA license, but a festival license allows people to buy the beer down there and drink it while they're milling around Absolutely. for whatever's happening you know, one, in that area. One thing that, um, as we're all kind of learning about POTA, and it's, it's not just, you know, it's, it's everyone that, that, that has to deal with it, is uh, realizing that these two licenses can't overlap or this this area and a festival license can't overlap geographically Mm -hmm. um where it causes problems with the code i know the legislature was trying to fix the poda law because there was a few flaws in it uh that Uh, they didn't get totally fixed but then the abc commissioner just says oh we're going to go ahead and Fix it administratively, I think. I'm not sure what all those were, if all the fixes are in, but uh, it it is confusing sometimes. Yeah, you you know, I I do think everyone's making their best effort to make it clear and make it make sense. Um, But it's it's a great addition to the city. Well, because it's uh, it's not just a state program. It's uh, state law, but it's really... Uh, kind of administered by city governments they have to enact it to, to allow it to happen in in the cities or municipalities so it's a little different kind of concept that that's new to west virginia i know we've seen some of those in other states around us like ohio has been doing it a couple of years longer uh, but uh, do you think that though your customers have caught on to it yet do you get requests for the poda cup oh we we certainly do yes um you know, I I can't I can't quote a number, but I know um, I know multiple orders have been placed for the Poda cups, and um, every every so business who's them. been doing it yeah. has been going through them. So, have you? Yeah. Is there a way? It's probably not a way to easily tell this, but it made me think. Do you notice or think it's more local customers, or do you think it's more people passing through the city that are utilizing it while they're here for the weekend or something like that? Mm, good question. You know, I, I, think, uh, I think the locals are certainly the ones in the know, but anyone who's interested in it, mm-hmm. as soon as they see mm-hmm. someone with sure. one of those cups, they're going to find out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I've always wondered, you know, how bars and, that participate in POTA, and you do have to sign up and maybe pay a little fee to the city to participate in the POTA district as a bar or a restaurant or even a retail store. You can allow people to come in your store even if you don't sell beer, and they can bring that POTA cup in if you want to allow that. 
Hmm. Well, it's in the early days still, and I'm sure... There's that, lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, the state and the cities will all be working together because there's now POTAs in Morgantown, and certainly the Huntington had the first one. Mm-hmm. They opened up last year, and I know there's still some confusion. There's still some law improvements that need to be done. I think we'll work this out. Probably your experience this summer will tell us a lot. Well, all right, Ross. Let's uh, change the subject from POTA because I'm getting thirsty. Um, I think it's time for you to select one of your beers from today's Bad Shepherd tap list. Excellent. One that uh, you'd like for us to try. So we're going to take a we're going to take a short break, and through the magic of radio editing, we'll be right back with a glass of Ross's beer. And we're back with Ross Williams at Bad Shepherd Beer Company in Charleston, West Virginia. Ross, will you introduce the beer you just brought us? I will. Yeah, this is, uh, this is our Maybach. Um, probably the fourth year I've brewed a Maybach. Yeah, so for our listeners who may not be familiar with a Maybach, and we call it Mai, but that's the German word for May. German, That's it's a right. German style beer, therefore that Maybach just means a beer that traditionally was uh, made for May. Right, right. A, a, a spring lager, um, you know, made to be enjoyed in the sunshine of spring. You know, it's it's strong enough to get you through those like chilly, rainy spring days, but it's um, you know it's best enjoyed on a warm spring day. Well, let's talk about those ingredients. What goes into a Maybach, for those that might not know, roughly? Oh, right. So, um, you know, with with the the German lagers we do, I really try to use German malt, generally uh, Weiermann or Weiermann. Uh, yeah, the I real thing. Mm-hmm. So, From Bamberg. Uh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. So using Pilsner malt, uh, Vienna malt, um, I use Munich malt in like the Oktoberfest, but uh, there's no Munich malt in in the Maybach. Just yeah. just Vienna and Pils. Yeah, it's a little um, lighter and cleaner that, because of that, probably. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, Munich Munich malt has a certain flavor, which is great in certain beers. Yeah. So, um, what would you? How would you describe this to somebody who's not had this type or this style of a beer before? As far as flavor notes. Okay, so well, let, let's just start start visually. Okay, you know we've got a golden lager, beautiful golden with color, a, with a, a clear body, and, and this is very um, clear, mm-hmm. and a nice white head. Yes, um, lacing. Yeah, lacy definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a fairly fairly malty, like rounded flavor on the beer. It's not like it's not as crisp as a lighter beer because this is like. Six point four percent, six point five percent. ABV. Yeah, ABV. Yeah, exactly. It packs a little more malt in both the mouthfeel and then the flavor than than you would in like a Pilsner or a Hellas Lager. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's uh, you know a, a little heavier body comes with all the extra grain to make that little higher ABV. Yeah. So um, I mean, if you were making an, another German lager, a lighter style German lager, you might be using a lot of these same ingredients, or basically the, even the same ingredients, uh, at least the styles of malt. That's uh, right. So how do you make this uh, Hellesbach different from the standard lager? Well, so we're we're using basically just more grain. Ah, uh, mo better. More grain to water <laughs> ratio. Um, Typically, I'm going to boil a little longer with a beer like this as well, and um, you know we're look we get about a 12 percent an hour evaporation rate, so you know an extra 15 minutes uh, really can uh, affect your your starting gravity on a beer. Flavor, um, you know, and then going on through on through the flavor, we get to the the bitterness and and hops in it. Um, and it's not a terribly bitter beer. Um, no, I don't know. find it b- bitter much at all, actually. I mean, there definitely is. I mean, there's hops in the beer. We mm-hmm. can taste those. What uh, Do you use the traditional uh, German hops like you use the traditional German malts? Ex- absolutely, yeah. Uh, we're using um, Hallertau 
middle fruel exclusively in this beer. Well, it, and, and another variety of middle fruel, the Hallertau Blanc, mm-hmm. which is a really nice hop. Um, actually, got get, picked those up from our friends at Free Folk. Uh, they had some extras and, you know, extra hops sitting oh. around. And I stopped in there just to see what the, was going on. And, and Jim was like, hey, do you want to <laughs> buy some hops? And I was like, sure. always, <laughs> always want to buy some hops. You yeah. know? Their yeah. loss is your gain. Yeah. Oh, well, he's, I, he's brewing very good beer with them himself. You know, he was kind of giving me some pointers on it. Oh, I see. So he just had way too much from what they really needed down there. I think he, I think he ended up buying a bunch of hops from, uh, from Big Draft. Ah. Uh, oh, when whenever they closed, they closed. down. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, it was like a fire sale oh boy. kind of a Ooh, good deal. You got a so, good, very good deal. I'm so sure. absolutely <laughs> great. You know, just just happy you pass that along because it's like, you know, easy drinking beer that's fairly easy on the pocket. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is an easy drinking beer, even it though is. it is a little higher ABV than, than what you're normally getting in a, in a lager or the standard lagers, but it looks deceivingly, you know, just like it, it could be a standard lager. Well, and I feel like it tastes that way as well. It's not one that tastes like it's got a higher ABV. Yeah, I, so I, get, I just get more body, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. In it, you know? Right, right. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about lagers is that low and slow fermentation it's a lot like smoking meat low and slow gets you the the tender good results right um it kind of mellows it out did you say how long you lagered this beer uh this 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 my bag was in the fermenter uh, i'd say eight or nine weeks oh wow and uh and then dropped drop bright and stayed in the bright tanks for you know less than a week but well the beer really brightened up it tastes so clean it's very mm-hmm. nice it's probably i yeah i don't mean to knock any of your other beers this is one of your better beers uh hey it, thank you not just this year but i've had it in past years so. same i, w- hey, I would i would agree with a, that statement it's a solid version of it and it um i said it earlier i said this is probably the best my technically brand. best brewed beer on on the menu today yeah and when i say that uh one of your best beers and, and i didn't like say i don't mean to denigrate any other beer that you make but this beer is in style very good i mean it's a i drink these beers other places too and you know, i can tell you this one is well made ross good hey, job thank you mm-hmm. thank you very I, much I would, I would absolutely agree. oh yeah you know no offense taken at all it's it's like Sometimes you know you have something special, and it's like, you know, maybe even you, even if you did everything the same way, it's the result has come out, and it's and it's a good one. Mm-hmm. It's a good feeling. I would agree, Russ. I've known you here as a Bad Shepherd head brewer for several years now, but one thing I haven't heard you talk about a lot is the beer styles that you personally prefer to drink, and also the beer styles that you most like to brew, but initially let's start with the styles that you most enjoy to drink let's talk about it oh wow you know it's a it's an evolving answer i guess well or, that's you know, fair let's talk over, about it <laughs> over time you know and it's some of it's seasonal but but i'll say you know i used to just kind of always jump to ipa mm-hmm. it's like ipa is you know the style for me as i've brewed and drunk a lot of ipa over the years I still enjoy it, but my palate has kind of gone for more like lighter beers like Pilsner's and, and like this Maybach we were just talking about uh, is high up on the list, high up on the list of styles, uh, Martin's, Oktoberfest, you know, kind of a, a clean beer that is still fairly bitter, but not, not overwhelmingly hoppy. Uh, you know, kind of straightforward. It's it's hard to hide the flaws in a style like that, and so it, it's enjoyable to drink a good example of it. Yeah, I see that in a lot of uh, places that I go, that the brewers and the assistant brewers, anybody back in the brew house, uh, enjoys a lager, especially if they make a good one. You know, that's something you see a lot of. Brewers drink a lot of lagers, folks, <laughs> and, and they probably these days drink more of those than they do their IPAs, and even though they make a lot of other beer styles, they tend to kind of gravitate to the lagers a lot of ones i see do well well sure you know it's it's like it's not like 
you have to do that much more work for a logger. The yeast does more work, maybe. Yeast does work for a longer time. But you have to wait. You know, you have to have patience. I mean, dry hopping an IPA is arguably more work day to day Mm -hmm. in making a beer. But uh, the patience and time it takes to get a lager the way it needs to be is is part of the satisfaction of drinking one. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you've talked about that, you know, initially IPA and then things have evolved to what sounds like a little bit more of a kind of traditional, not that IPA isn't, but a traditional original flagship style beers. Um, is, does what you like to drink also go hand in hand with, with what you like to brew the most now that, that that's evolved? In other words, a lager or something or a pilsner that you, you would prefer to brew over an IPA? Well, now, now that's funny because probably not. <laughs> um, Why not? You, well, tying up a tank for two months is not always what needs to happen around here. And uh, we're lucky that we do have enough enough tanks to make some lagers, um, but it it definitely kind of puts the pinch on sometimes. Just and so, because of space, right? Right. So, like a nice IPA that you can turn around in fourteen days to twenty twenty one days, some, somewhere in between there, is um, is always nice because it just keeps it moving. You know it's fresh. You know it's you know it's going out the door, and you're getting you're getting paid for all these ingredients you put in. Sure, sure. And I, I understand that answer from a business standpoint, but from your personal standpoint as a brewer, if if space weren't an issue, and you know needing to turn product over weren't an issue, obviously that's not in the real world. But would a a logger or a pilsner be more enjoyable for you if if you weren't worried about the product? Oh, well, I mean. Enjoyment, enjoyment on brew day is, is pretty much the same around here, regardless of the style. Um, you know, pretty straightforward brew day on just about everything until we get into, like, imperial stouts and stuff. And those are, those are you know, that makes for a long, hard day because it's a, like a double mash reusing the first word. And it... it has turned into like a 13 hour day before. Wow. So I'll take a, I'll take a regular, a regular <laughs> seven, seven percent or right. lower beer to brew any day. Yeah. And I want to remind people that a lot of times you go in a small brewery and maybe they have a lager occasionally, but they don't always have lagers because of that time that it takes. It's going to stay in that tank several times longer, tie up that tank. And if they only have like a, four uh, fermenters or tanks you know to put their beer in or something at a small place that's not likely they're going to do a lot of lagers you know because they got to keep things on tap and they want to turn beers quickly and the ale styles certainly turn as you were saying a lot quicker mm-hmm. oh absolutely mm-hmm. well here in west virginia in 2024 we're still seeing that the fastest moving beers overall at our local breweries are, I'm going to say, IPAs and fruited up quick sours. Uh, Ross, would you agree or disagree from what you see here at Bad Shepherd Beer, Bad Shepherd beer Company? Oh, the yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. Um, yeah. And why do you think this is? You know, it's, it's not just... Uh, it's kind of a trendy thing, but but it's like, why is it a trendy thing? It's because they're delicious, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> years, years ago, when I worked in a worked in a restaurant, there was some question about how to present some dish or how to make some dish, and uh, and we were in the kitchen, and and the boss is like, just make it delicious, <laughs> and it's it's you know not hard to do when you're packing fruit into a beer um same with same with cool new hops you know it's you're you're kind of teasing the palate towards something new and um you know some of us myself included like having a familiar thing like uh like a the lighter beers we were talking about earlier um or a standard beer like Guinness that you can go back to over and over. 
and that's fine, but there are certainly customers out there who want something new, mm -hmm. you know, and they want something different. And a, a really great way to do that as a brewer is to change up hops and change up fruit on kind of a base beer that you're familiar with and you know is going to work. I always, and we've talked about it before, as far as especially fruited sours, they are really great for new customers, new people coming into craft beer that haven't experienced craft beer. So I, I certainly see not only people that just enjoy them because they enjoy them, but they are a good kind of bridge, I feel like, um, to a new craft beer drinker. So I get that. And, and I understand why it would always be good to have, or I would think it would be in a brewery's best interest to have something similar to that as an offering. Earlier, you mentioned, Ross, that the Electric Petting Zoo was a beer you make here and I guess sells well for you. You have a couple of other IPAs that also sell quite well, and you traditionally almost always have at least one of them on tap. Uh, talk a little bit about your IPAs. Oh, sure. Um, you know, we always have the loud. I mean, barring some production issue. And how would, uh, how would you say that differs from Electric Petting Zoo? Uh, okay, so the, the Loud and the Electric Petting Zoo are certainly sister beers. The big differences between them, I would say, is one, in the grain bill. Uh, the Loud uses Pilsner malt as part of the base malt. And the Electric Petting Zoo... I substitute white wheat malt for that Pilsner malt. And so it's a very similar grain bill with that one substitution. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how brewers can just make little adjustments in, whether, in their inputs, you know, whether it's a wheat uh, malt or whether it's a, you know, a Munich malt. I mean, whatever you've got, you've got all these malts and playing with them makes the recipe and the beer turns out Sure. Different, different in style. So the, the Loud certainly has malted wheat in it as well. Uh, the Petting Zoo has more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the ratios you know. are different. And then, and then no, you know, no Pilsner. Right. Um, Hop-wise, they're, they're quite different. You know, the Loud gets a, a serious bittering dose of, uh, of hop extract, you know, I a get. little more traditional American style IPA, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah the, you, you, know. you know, I'd say the Loud's coming in at forty some to fifty some IBUs, mm -hmm. um, depending on what calculator you use for that. Uh, but it's somewhere in there, you know. And uh, and Petting Zoo, I, you know, on the high end is probably eighteen to twenty um, IBUs, and at and really, on, on paper, it's much lower than that. But realistically, that's what it tastes like. Yeah, and, and probably are, are a lot of the hops in the Petting Zoo uh, late editions or, or in dry hopped? Yes, it has, uh, in, unless it's really foaming up in the boil and we need to like throw a handful in to break the foam, because it, it helps with that. Because uh, I don't use any kind of like foam additions, you know. They they make all this stuff to add to your beer, and I, when it's boiling, like foam control stuff, and I've never seen the need for that. No strange uh, additives here. At, no, uh, that at, stu yeah. that's man, that stuff's <laughs> weird. I think it makes your beer taste weird. But mm -hmm. no, I I install a bio monitor, see, for the boil with a cold yeah. water hose. His name's Fielden. <laughs> Um, he's the best so, biomonitor I've got. Not actually a monitor, it's a real live human. Yeah, a biomonitor. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's, it has almost or zero, depending on how the atmospheric pressure is that day, mm -hmm. boil hops. And it, it only gets whirlpool hops after the whirlpool has cooled down a little bit. That just shows you again an, another determination a decision brewer has to make about how i want to make this beer do i want to put the hops in early middle late and what ratios in each i mean it's like hey make that uh, choice and make a good beer i mean it, it it's a bit trial and error i'm sure oh it certainly is i mean and it's you know i mean the 
The good news is the final product is very similar uh, with a handful of hops thrown in early Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just a handful and we're dumping a whole bucket in the whirlpool. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, encourage anyone that's listening to can get over here to uh, Bad Shepherd Beer Company to come on in and sit at the bar and try some of those IPAs and get them side by side. Like the loud's pretty much always here. That's their make their main flagship but things like electric petting zoo and other ipas they'll have which will have different styles of of way they're putting the ingredients together and compare those that's a lot of fun and i think that's probably one of the things that makes ipas so popular in west virginia today is that every if there's all these different brewers making a bunch of ipas and they're all little different tweaks to the taste I know some people say, well, that makes them all taste the same because they're all pretty much the same. Oh, but, I don't think that. But, the, hey, you know, you hear all kinds of comments. I, de- I mean, I, I get that that comes out a lot. But I personally don't. I mean, I think if you if you do, as you said, come in, you taste them side by side, you'll you'll pick up the subtleties. Even yeah. if you're new to, to tasting IPAs, there oh, definitely yeah. is a difference. And that's also the way you learn about what hops do and the different varieties of hops, how they flavor the beers differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So something I'm curious about is your brewery's ownership group that has several other restaurants and bars over in Huntington, West Virginia, and it's just 50 miles away from us here in Charleston, but they're all really popular places. And I'm kind of wondering, though, do you see a difference in the Huntington market's taste in beer versus Charleston? Is it similar, different, the same? Well, I I would say overall I do think it's fairly similar, but in terms of... Uh, Black Sheep in Huntington, mm-hmm. Bonhoff in Huntington, and The Loud in Huntington. And that's The Loud bar, not The Loud uh, beer we were just talking that's about. Right, that's right, that's right. Might yeah. be the first establishment named after a beer. <laughs> hey, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> at least in this country that I, that I know of. Um, yeah, really cool. Uh, I, I do think people go for something new. Um, when something new comes out, you know, they're going to want to try it. Yeah. So that's always exciting. Yeah, I just wondered maybe because the Bonhoeff restaurant has so much German emphasis on the food and things, does that affect the beer? Do people look more for German-style beers there? Oh, yes. Or do they still drink IPAs? Oh, yes. Well, no, they certainly still drink IPA at Bonhoeff, but... Uh, but yeah, they, they tend to go through more of the kind of what I would call traditional Euro and German style beers. Um, so this Maybach we just drank earlier might sell better there relatively than, than, than it might here at this oh, it, bar or at the other, uh, uh, yeah, black It's certainly, black certainly the perfect beer to drink with schnitzel, and uh, oh, yeah. and the different oh, sausages, yeah. Um, yeah. so so yeah, they they certainly they certainly do go through that. Well, beyond Huntington and Charleston markets, where else do you regularly sell Bad Shepherd beers? Oh well, we we tend to sell in a lot of the state, not all of the state, but you know have a pretty wide wide range and. Uh, at our best count, 50-some regular accounts. What beers seem to be the most popular in those markets other than the Charleston-Huntington markets? What beers? Mm-hmm. Uh, cer- you know, certainly the Loud, Chuck Down Colch, Shot Caller, kind of our core base beers. Um, but then anything new. Why do you think the Bad Shepherd's Bad Shepherd beers sell well in those particular places. I mean, you don't distribute them to that many accounts. You know, how how do you kind of make that distinction as far as who do you want to sell to or how how what do you do to look for an account? Well, the the good news is kind of rotation nation, and that's not my term, but you know, <laughs> I didn't come up with that. But people want new beers. They want interesting stuff and variety. So we try to reach out to new establishments and uh you know it's really a matter of making contact with with a new account um you know the ideal new account wants to take good care of this beer they've just invested in and bought right 
They want to keep it cold. They want to clean their draft lines regularly. Right. Um, and and also like kind of cross promote. You know, we're, we're always looking for that. So we, yeah, characteristics to, for we try to reach out to to new accounts and figure out how we can help push them and how they can mention us in their posts and stuff like that. I mean, are you interested more than in established bars and restaurants where you can actually kind of judge the quality of their staff? I mean, do they know beer? You don't want to just be in some roadhouse that's pumping out, you know, Bud Light. They don't know what they're selling and they put your beer on tap. I mean, you probably don't sell. The, that's kind of the decision we're asking about. How do you get in there and select the kind of account what's the profile of an account you're looking for when you sell because your beers are a little more select i mean they're not everywhere you don't push them everywhere that's right that's right i mean you know part of it part of it is kind of self-selecting not every bar wants to sell craft beer True. Uh, and so a lot of times people are reaching out to us and that shows an interest you know mm -hmm. that kind of at that point if they've never gotten into craft beer before, that's the opportunity for us to kind of educate and kind of help them to grow into it. <laughs> I know I have uh, more than once had enjoyed a Bad Shepherd beer at the airport when I was flying for one reason or another. Um, do you typically maintain an, oh, absolutely. that account? The, I the thought air, that The you airport did. is a great account mm -hmm. for us. Um, well, guys, I think it's time for another short break so we can freshen up our beer taster glasses. Ross, do you have us another beer you'd like for us to try? Absolutely. All right, then. Let's give Ross a few seconds to pour Aaron and I another sample, and we'll be right back to talk about it. And we're back with Ross Williams at Bad Shepherd Beer Company in Charleston, West Virginia. Ross, tell us about the beer you just brought us. Okay, this is a, a brand new IPA with a name that has been sitting on our list for years now. Oh, wow. Uh, Jake Dempsey came up with this name. This is Chuck Norris Jeans Chuck IPA. Chuck Norris Jeans. Okay. Because, Wait a minute. Because that beer is tight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> nice, nice name word play there. All right, well... Give us some more information. We, we talked a little bit about some, you know, loud and some uh, EPZ or electric petting zoo IPA ingredients and a little differences with those earlier. So how's this one different or similar to the two that we've already discussed? Right. Okay. Well, this isn't exactly like a, a kitchen sink grain bill, but it is, a, it is fairly different from my like kind of standard IPA grain bill. Okay. Um, just more two-row barley, uh, more American two-row. Um, so kind of a milder, lighter uh, grain bill, um, a little more golden color. The loud's kind of like almost orange. Uh, so this is a little different color from that on, a, on first appearance. Yeah, the malts really um, are less intense in this less one. Less intense malts. Still getting a nice cereal flavor. Um, but okay, we're featuring Lotus Cryo Hops Ooh. and then Idaho 7 and some other dank hops to back that up. And so we're getting this big dankness without much bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, it's very citrusy, zesty. My first aroma is like a lemon blueberry. Um, and then it's this big, dank, citrusy, resinous flavor. But it, the, the aftertaste to me is almost like a, a fruity pebbles blueberry kind of thing going on. I get a little bit of grapefruit somewhere in that. Sure, citrusy. It's there's definitely citrusy. some grapefruit. It's very back to the color. Um, it, it's it's a hazy. It's a lighter, like you said, a lighter kind. Of, it's a hazy um, looking IPA. Well, yeah, it's a hazy in appearance, but it ain't hazy in the c c uh, current popular style of hazy. Right, right. It's it's kind of a unique thing. I mean, it's it's not you know bitter on paper like I said. IBUs not at pretty all. low, mm -hmm. but when you dump in these cryo hops and all these other hops in the whirlpool, you're still you know you're still getting bitterness. Right. Yeah. No, I get bitterness, and I also uh, would say it's a 
less body than your your other hazy beers that are meant to be more like New England style hazies because they give a give you more of that body feel. Right, right. This one um, is thinner, I'd say, with more emphasis on the hops. Yeah, uh, we're looking at a lower lower ABV here, uh, six point two, um, and uh, and a a lower body, you know, like less body. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that's just how it works out. It's not really the goal for this beer, but sometimes that's how it ends up. <laughs> so it's not really a comment on the genes that uh, it's named after. Hey, that beer is tight. <laughs> you know? it, it is uh, tight. It's, it's and, a delicious beer. And for me, I mean, I really do get the blueberry. I get. I definitely and, get some and blueberry. I'm, I'm waiting for you to get that fruity pebbles mm-hmm. in the aftertaste. Well, I really am. I, and I think one of the things in, that we deal with normally and often at bars uh, is that our IPAs are served a little cold, and this one's come out of the tap quite cold. And for me, when it warms up some, I get so much more aromas and flavors. And maybe this one will in a few minutes. We'll be drinking it. Well, we'll give it a minute or two. Ross, I know you came here from Morgantown Brewing, where you got your first experience in brewing beer. Did you begin working there while you were still a student at West Virginia University? I did not, no. It was after? Well, I know you got uh, that your degree programs at WVU were in fields totally unrelated to brewing. So what were they exactly? Oh, yeah. I have a, I have a degree in English Lit. Uh, from WVU. Um, WVU's English program is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Always has been. A very strong program there. And, um, you know, I had some great professors uh, and and learned a lot of of really valuable, you know, skills and and stuff there, too. I imagine Um, it's helped you come up with beer names. You know, that's that's certainly part of it. you know, when when you have to buckle down and do some research, that you know that academic background comes in for you. You know, was it just English lit? I thought there was a, a secondary degree. Uh, I I went back to school and got an MBA. Ah, okay, okay. Well, my question is, how do you get from English lit and an MBA to deciding to make your brewing beer your career? What were you thinking? You know, I I looked for brewing jobs all along the way and uh and it was home brewing you know um making wine and uh and home brewed beer um and your your hobby became then a profession it did it did and and that just you know i wasn't expecting it at the time i'd been working in restaurants and uh was kind of thinking you know management career in that would be would be very interesting because i loved cooking and uh and love the the restaurant environment you know it's uh busy and um and varied and a lot of interesting people mm-hmm. come into your life and so it's uh, it's a great place to be and that's kind of the direction i thought i was i was going to end up in and then got a job at morgantown brewing company <laughs> And fell in love with brewing, or I'm, I'm not sure. That's right. That's right. <laughs> fell more in love. With. More, yes, yes. So you, you veered more towards that versus being a chef or or in a restaurant. Oh, I I I was never a chef and never never could be. I I think, but I do think I was uh, a decent cook. Well, if you could look ahead five years or so, where do you see yourself in terms of your brewing career? Oh man. Hopefully, um, hopefully still brewing, hopefully still making good beer. I'd like to see some mixed fermentation mm-hmm. coming down the line in my future, and I have a little bit of that going, but be interested in more of that. Hopefully the public comes around and wants to buy more of that so I can make more of that. Mm-hmm. Well, you said you uh, worked at Morgantown Brewing. Of course, that's where you came from right before you moved to Charleston to brew at Bad Shepherd. Uh, now we hear recent the rumblings up in Morgantown. Art Gallagher, or the owner of Morgantown Brewing, uh, he's back at it again. Uh, there's going to be some changes up there. Going to reopen the brewery that had, uh, I guess, closed for a while. 
Do you know anything about that? I mean, is that uh, something that uh, you're hearing a lot about or think it'll make a, a real splash in the Morgantown market? Oh, it, you know, it's, it's a great location and uh, historic brewery. Um, so my understanding is they have an opening date uh, in July. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure of the date. It might be July 1st. No, that's all right. I know it's just coming um, up this summer, apparently. But, yeah, my understanding is uh, one of the former chefs will be opening the restaurant, and he's, he's great at, at what he does. And so I, I can only expect the restaurant and bar will be um, up to par with anything in the state. Yeah, well, it's quite a historic brewery, at least in the craft beer era. It's the first real brewery in, in West Virginia when it opened uh, different names, but it's been in that same location, basically with the same equipment mm-hmm. for a long time. And mm-hmm. they're still brewing on equipment they, they got back in the 90s. And Oh, yes. yes. I, I think 1992, I Yeah, believe. so I was really happy to hear that it's not going to be gone. I was worried that it might close and be gone forever and that we lost a historic brewery, but it's good to hear that it is uh, going to be reopened. Well, that's that's my understanding, and uh, I, I look forward to visiting them. Us. You well, know, me too. When they're, when they're opened back up and wish them all the best. Well, Ross, a lot of people see you here brewing at Bad Shepherd, but... Many of the customers may not know that you grew up in West Virginia's eastern panhandle, probably four hours or so uh, from here. And uh, I'm just wondering, what was it like for you growing up there? Oh, it it was a a wonderful place to grow up, Um, Romney, West Virginia. You know, it's a small town, always something to do outdoors, regardless of the season, uh, to occupy yourself. Really, really beautiful, nice place to be. I, I guess that probably influenced your uh, creative thoughts in regards to maybe food and or brewing, just being so involved in outdoors as you grew up. Maybe not. I don't know. What do you think about that? Because I know you've, I, we've talked personally that you, I know you like, and you just mentioned fermentation and you're intrigued by that. Was that part of your upbringing or just something you? Oh, yes. Uh, my grandfather's family had an orchard and uh, we weren't operating an orchard or anything when I was growing up but we did have apple trees around and uh, always made apple butter apple cider and um, my brothers and I were fascinated that the the cider would ferment Mm -hmm. all on its own and often quickly become vinegar if it were if it was not kept in the fridge you know Uh, and eventually I, I realized there was a middle point there before it became vinegar where the cider was something very interesting to drink. And so I'm, I'm still intrigued by cider, uh, you know, but um, making it at home has always been hit or miss for me and uh, I have great admiration for these, these folks at the local cideries like Hawk Knob who have it down to a science mm-hmm. and, a, you know, an art and a science. Well, growing up around all that farming and agriculture in the Romney area there in Hampshire County, big agriculture county, I mean, for West Virginia, do you think that you've carried that influence on to adulthood and right to this Bad Shepherd Beer Company? I mean, is that impacting still things that you do here? Uh, maybe, maybe in a certain way, you know, uh, something I've realized as a, as a professional brewer is how difficult it is to use fresh local fruit without having a purpose-built brewery set up for that. You know, we, we don't have a good way to process a lot of fruit here. Sure. Um, so we're relying on, you know, frozen fruit, uh, aseptic puree in bags, uh, things like that. But, but I do think that... Um, just being exposed to local, uh, you know, local produce, uh, a wide variety of different offerings from, you know, different local people, it, it always made me open to kind of like trying new things and, and experimenting and being interesting. Uh, it, 
being into interesting new things, you know. Neighbors would grow a, a unique crop sometimes. The, the bird's egg beans, I remember going to pick those with my mother as a, as a really young child. And going to pick them made it so much more fun and interesting to eat them. And I don't know, as a, as a young child, if, if I would have like wanted to eat those strange-looking beans if we hadn't gone to pick them Mm -hmm. and uh and they were delicious you know well talking about uh, farming and agriculture has made me uh rethink this beer that we're drinking here that uh mr norris (laughs) in his jeans his (laughs) tight tight. jeans (laughs) very tight jeans (laughs) no but i just want to say it's warmed up now in this little taster glass and and i definitely am getting some of that berry you were talking about Mm -hmm. the blueberry flavor Mm -hmm. it's coming through so uh you didn't make that up and that's not from adding blueberries that's just from you think from just the hops that's from that that is 100 percent from the lotus hops yeah yeah well, we've talked a little bit about a few of your beers you currently have on tap, uh, but uh, customers, though, listening to this podcast, and they're down the road here another week or two and probably thinking, hmm, wonder what he has on tap now. So what's coming up this summer here? What are some of the highlights that people will find, beers you're encouraged about or want to brew or are brewing that will be out this summer at Bad Shepherd Beer Company? Yeah, uh, super excited to brew this year's first batch of Betty White IPA. <laughs> um, plan to brew that on Thursday. And um, why would people want to drink a Betty White? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, because it has uh, sweet orange peel and a little coriander in a heavy wheat That's a based wh- IPA. Oh, yeah. And, so, uh, like a white wheat? sort of yeah it's yeah, a little it's, uh, wit beer hybrid yeah. almost kind of a, a wit beer ipa cross i like yeah. and, i like some betty um, you know <laughs> so people have always people have been, well they enjoyed it last year i think it was the first year we did it mm-hmm. so looking forward to that just ordered grain for cloud machine <gasps> yes and you can tell that that was the first the the first brew of that was kind of a like was kind of a kitchen sink brew because it has half a bag of this and half a bag of that, half a bag of malted rye. Wow. And it's like, why is that in there? Oh, because <laughs> it was left over in the grain room the first time we brewed this beer and it worked out. And now we have to put it, now <laughs> so we have to a kitchen do or that. Or have to try to figure that out, don't you? Uh, it, it's fun. I'll just have to brew a second batch, you know, a little on down the road and use the other half of that bag of malted rye. Hey, two batches for your customers of Cloud Machine? I imagine people are excited to hear about that'll, that. That'll stretch it out through the <laughs> summer. Yes. Um, then a little little uncharacteristic maybe for the season, but, uh, but something that's going to be fun because it's different. We need to make a Dunkelweizen. Ah. In the summer, you're making a Dunkelweizen. Let's talk about what a Dunkelweizen is at Bad Shepherd. Yeah, it's a fairly traditional recipe. Um, it's a darker wheat beer, to make it simple. And uh, fairly traditional darker wheat beer. And, uh, and that brings it back to the Bonhof in Huntington, yeah. you know, German, German restaurant. Uh, well, they need these different German styles of beer. Apparently, the market is such right now, you can't get a Dunkelweizen. Uh, All right. From distributors. So uh, well, you said that, you're that kind of drives it. But I, but I have a recipe I've used before that I, yeah, so I think is quite good. What uh, grain are you using to get your color in that wheat beer that's different from just your Hefeweizen, and, you know, a lighter style? Pale? Right. Um, well, so I'm going to use um, some caramel malt. Uh, it's a, a light caramel. Mm-hmm. Uh, also going to use some um, some pale chocolate malt. Uh, not a lot, right? Just a little, a little sweetness. bit, Tiny. just a little bit, um, and that's that's for color, probably more than flavor. Uh-huh. Um, 
and that's but that's you know right in there yeah so when um, i think of dunkelweizen you know i do think of the little bit of touch of caramel in the in the body of the malts and the and you know within the taste and then also you your hops are and the fermentation are well i guess really the fermentation are bringing you some of that banana clove characteristics yes and, and so you're seeking that so it's going to be a traditional i, I think style. so yes uh using a using a german wheat beer yeast and um and a, a lot of uh a lot of uh what pale malted wheat yeah yes so uh Ger- german f- from germany pale it, pale malted wheat oh super well and, that's uh, something you don't see in west virginia very often i'm sure not that I know of, anyway. And I think that it's fair to say that the hops really don't play uh, much of a role at all in, a, in the traditional uh, wheat beers you know, from Germany. They don't, but because of reasons, I will be using real noble German hops in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it and it would be it would be pretty simple and straightforward to substitute almost any hop as a bittering hop. But because I have this nice Hallertau hop, uh, we'll, we'll showcase it, you know, try to get it in there. And, uh, it, well, and I'm, this is probably wrong of me, but uh, I'm probably going to throw a later edition in. Oh, my hops. gosh. Just a little bit. Don't and, ruin it. You know, <laughs> try not to ruin it. <laughs> Just a little bit. Sounds like you're excited to make this beer. We're yeah. excited to drink it. Well, one thing I regularly notice here at Bad Shepherd is the frequency that I see empl- the employees coming in and relaxing when they're not working, just kind of on their own time. It's apparent that they really like the place and hanging out here together. And I think that's something that you don't necessarily see a lot of at other places. Um, and in addition to that, the tenure of, in particular, the bar staff, um, there's not much turnover here. Uh, it at least hasn't been in a number of years. I know that you in particular aren't exactly in charge of hiring bar and restaurant staff. It's not your responsibility. But but who should get that, that credit for maintaining such an excellent group of employees? Because they certainly are. Oh, well, yeah, our, our staff's phenomenal. Um, you know, and, and you see the front of house, but back of house in the kitchen, uh, those, those folks are great as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and yeah, it, it's a it's fairly low turnover as you know in my time here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our our managers are great, um, Clayton and Kevin. Uh, Kevin's the, ge- the general manager, uh, and Clayton's the assistant manager. He's been here a long time. They've both done almost every job in the building. Uh, and uh, I'm always impressed by them. Um, you know, they they tend to uh, tend to get their stuff done, um, but they kind of set the tone, you know. And of course, they're the ones doing the hiring. Sure. Yeah, and I uh, don't come in here a whole lot. I shouldn't. Sorry for the chefs that make all this wonderful food here, but I don't eat a lot of the food enough that I could tell you what all's on the menu. Uh, so when people come to Bad Shepherd Beer Company and, and also to the Black Sheep Burrito Restaurant, and that's the same as the one in Huntington, I think they have the same menus. Could you just kind of highlight in general the kind of cuisine people find if they haven't had a chance to, to, to come here? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great menu that spans from uh, a traditional like California mission style burrito over to this Asian fusion kind of uh, kind of bent on it um, with a lot of nods to different traditional cuisines from different places you know there's there's Korean bulgogi um, Mexican Rojas sauce uh, and everything in between. Oh, you can still get a burger here, too. You can absolutely still get a burger, like a double-decker smash burger. Um, and, you know, they're a little over the top, but that's <laughs> kind of what we do. Yeah, but there's um, also a lot of variety you in know. terms of and, and, preference. And, of course, there's, yeah, there's, there's a, whole, a whole menu for kids and stuff with chicken tenders, chicken wings. 
vegetarians. Um, absolutely. Vegetarian and vegan options. Uh, really try to be conscientious about all of that. Well, Ross, it's been great having you with us today on our podcast West Virginia Beer Roads is always happy to stop in Bad Shepherd Beer Company and a Black Sheep Burrito for the food and listen I'll tell you uh, it's been I guess it's been educational I should say I learned more about what you're doing why you're doing it where you came from uh, that is always good for me to hear thanks Charles yeah, Ross, we, we've definitely enjoyed our time this evening and letting us pick your brain. So thank you very much. And we look forward to all of those fabulous beers that you described that we can look forward to this summer. You're so welcome. Thank you, Charles and Aaron. This brings us to the close of another podcast. Remember, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast host. Thank you for listening to West Virginia Beer Roads. West Virginia Beer Roads is a production of BrilliantStream.com.